Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship here at Freedom's Church. Beautiful, welcoming music today by Doug and Tony. Thank you, guys. Always wonderful music on our Sundays that we have here. It's good to see you all here today. It's a wonderful day in so many ways, and those who are watching online, welcome to, to worship, and we welcome everyone who's here today. The sun is out. It's been a long time since we've seen the sun. I like the sun to me, in my mind, it's 85 degrees and we're all feeling very good right now, even though the wind chill makes it a little, little cold, but it's good to see you all out here uh, today. A few announcements for us today. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. We begin the season of Lent uh, in March 2nd, and so we'll have a service here. There will be a soup and sandwich supper on Wednesday. Uh, from 5.30 to 6.30 over in the Activity Center, and donations are, are accepted for that, and followed by our Ash Wednesday service at 7 p.m. with both communion and with the imposition of ashes. Just a word about that on communion. I think it's good to say we had long discussions about this with worship committee and, and our uh, church council. We're going to have a uh, different way. We're going to serve communion uh, beginning Wednesday and uh, hopefully next Sunday from now on, we will not be using the little bags uh, any longer. We're going to have everyone Wednesday night. <laughs> you can clap if you want to. I understand that. Uh, we've been thankful we've been able to have communion the last uh, nearly uh, all this time. But we're going to have uh, folks on Wednesday night. You'll be coming forward to receive both uh, the wafer and the cup together. So everyone come forward. We'll take it to you on Wednesday if you can't. Uh, come forward with that. But that's how we're going to start doing it from now on in the safest possible way that we can. So we're going to try this Wednesday night, and I think it's going to work well. And of course, we'll have our ashes together uh, with that service as well. So Wednesday night, Ash Wednesday service, as we begin now and prepare ourselves for the season of Lent in preparation for Easter. We are saddened to announce the passing of Jean Newman. She passed away on Friday. Uh, the services will, for Jean will be here at the church this Saturday at 1130. And the beautiful flowers today are presented and prepared by the family uh, in, in memory of Jean today on the altar. So keep uh, that uh, family in prayers today. It's good to see you today and your family. And uh, just wonderful visits with Jean the last several days and, and weeks. And... Uh, our thoughts and prayers are indeed with you all this day and for this week. A lot of things that are happening in the life of the church. We're starting now just to get this new church year underway. We've had uh, new council members meet with the church council. We have new boards uh, and committees. And now it's our hope and prayer to get folks to work and doing so many wonderful things here in the life of the church. And things are happening already. Uh, and for what we do so keep that in prayer and there's a ministry or thing that you want to be a part of you let me know or sign you know we'll make sure that you get involved in so many different ways with that and now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship please stand as miss landry wilson now comes to lead us in our call to worship god the holy one reigns let the people tremble <coughs> Praise the Holy One, our God, and worship at God's holy mountain. Mighty ruler, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have brought forth righteousness and justice. You led your people and spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. God of love, lead us by your light. Transform us by your grace, that we may truly follow Christ. Alleluia. Let us sing together our opening praise hymn this morning, Christ whose glory fills the skies.
the church calendar as Transfiguration Sunday, which celebrates Jesus being transformed into his glory for all to see. And it is truly how we celebrate Jesus and all his glory as we worship together. So let us greet one another in that glory, in that peace of Christ, letting each other know that you're glad that we are all here together. Peace be with you. Thank you. What a wonderful and glorious warm spirit today. It's time for our children's sermon. All the children can come and join me here at the front. Good morning. It's good to see you all here today, and I'm glad you're part of our worship. I'll show you this poster, and it is a painting, like a drawing, of a scene that happened in the Bible so many years ago. And I wanted to show you that here in the front are three of Jesus' disciples. Remember, he had 12 disciples that he called. Here's three, and it's Peter, James, and John. I'm not sure which one is which, but it's Peter and James and John. And they're looking at three other people there on top of this mountain. One is Jesus, and one is Moses, and one is Elijah. And this is a very interesting picture because one day, Jesus took three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, up to a mountaintop. And they had to walk a long way. There were some trails and some paths, but they had to walk up this mountain to the top. And when they got there with Jesus, suddenly the appearance of Jesus just changed. He got very bright, and it's like his face was almost glowing, and then suddenly there was Moses, and there was Elijah along beside him. Now, this had never, ever happened before, although at the top of the mountain, that both Moses and Elijah would have their appearance with God, but this was very, very new. These three, Peter, James, and John, had never, ever seen anything like this before at all. It was a glorious, glorious sight. It was like they're almost in, in heaven. And then Peter was so amazed by the whole thing. This was the most amazing thing that Peter had ever seen in his life. And he says to his friends, James and John, and he even says to Jesus, this is the most marvelous thing. We need to stay here right now with you on top of this mountain. Let's build some shelters for us all just to, to live in and stay right here. We don't want to leave again. This is the most wonderful place that we have seen. Have you ever gone to some place in your life where you thought it was so wonderful, so good, just so great, you didn't want to leave? Disney World. Disney World. Oh, my goodness. I want to tell you that we, we have been to Disney World when we lived in Florida a number of times and even some a person my age can think it's the most glorious place forever until you buy all the tickets and wait in lines for all the food and stuff like that. But for a child, oh my goodness, this is the most great place, a magical place on earth. Well, Peter thought the same thing about on top of this mountain there in Galilee, and he didn't want to leave. He said, let's build some places we can just sit and stay here and watch. And Jesus said, this is indeed a grand and glorious sight. You have witnessed almost like what heaven's going to be. But we can't stay here. We have to go back down the mountain to the people who need us. And that's what they did. So it's like they saw heaven, but they had to go back down from the mountain on earth, back down to the people, because Jesus would tell them, he said, on earth is God's will and my will done as it is in heaven. We must go to the people. 
And almost as soon as they got down from the mountain, indeed, a man came up to Jesus saying, I need your help. And Jesus and the disciples were ready to help them. So as a church, we come and on our worship, we want to have this experience with God and with Jesus through our music, our singing, our prayers and what we do. But then we know as a church and people, we have to go back out and help people, people in need. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We'll try to do our best every day to do that. Let's pray together. Oh, holy God, we give you thanks for Jesus and disciples and the great stories. Help us, oh Lord, to see you and feel like heaven is so close, but also help us that we're in the world. We need to help people, help our brothers and sisters and our families and our friends and to be good to one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Remember, boys and girls, how much God always loves you. And so do we. There is children's and our younger youth Sunday school. You can follow the leaders. They'll take them over to the activity center and you can pick them up right after church today. If you're able, please stand. This morning, we're, our praise song is Arise, which speaks of the glory of God. The purpose of worship is for us to indeed worship God, to give glory to God. So pay attention to these words, to this song. It's very uplifting and speaks of the glory, the gloria of God.
seated. So this Wednesday begins the season of Lent, where we focus on Christ's journey to the cross, and then beyond with Easter, it is 40 days, minus the Sundays, where they, we are able to spend time and focus on whether it is taking something away from our lives that we focus too much attention on or adding something in which we add service. But this next video that I want to share is a reflection on the journey of Lent. We do approach the time of Lent in our lives, in the life of the world and the Christian world and churches as we prepare ourselves for Easter each and every day. In our prayer concerns today, we want to, to remember uh, the family of Gene Newman, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, the service for Gene will be this Saturday at 11.30 here at the church. Also, please continue to pray for Yvonne Robbins, the family of Bob Robbins, who's passed away. His service is later in the month on March the 19th. And certainly all those family and friends of these families, keep in mind in prayer all those that are part of our church family in hospitals and nursing homes and uh, rehabilitation centers today. Many, so many need our prayers and our love and support in their lives. We pray for each person. We pray for them and how they're living their lives and certainly our community and our nation and our world. On this day, too, we need to be mindful of events that happen not only in our own neighborhoods and lives, but around the world. Even events that take place halfway around the world with people we will never know and places we'll perhaps never go to, but we pray. And sometimes it's not easy to know how to pray for things in life. Just who are we praying for and why and for what reasons for there? It seems to be a, sometimes the world can be a big mess depending on particular events and with people's actions around us. We can't always change the actions of world leaders, but we can also change and always change our own hearts and minds and our thinking too. So what do we pray for and how do we pray? First of all, we pray for these, this, that God's spirit of peace and hope and love and joy and the good things of the world are made known to people's lives all over. That is always there. God's spirit is always there. The big challenge for us in the world is how do we avail ourselves of that spirit? And that is a spirit of peace. I truly believe it's a spirit of the peace. This church has even named that peace. Peace Church Freedoms is. And so it is there. And so what I want to do is be strengthened in my own life and my own 
heart and mind and a spirit and through my words that I will be a person of peace and to expect that from others. And when more and more people rally around that to be peace-filled in their lives, then that is a great message for the rest of the world. I know it gets disheartening at times. We've become very jaded and skeptical of things that happen around us. But I pray that we do not let all of that around us affect us adversely in our lives through our own thoughts and thinking in our hearts and our minds and our souls. God is with us. God loves us. God's love and presence prevails above all, beyond all, and through all, through all time. That's the God we serve. That's the God who loves us. That's the God who equips and strengthens us every day of the journey of our lives, whether it's right here or somewhere else, any place else. That's the hope we have in God, as we know in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, we come to you on this day, a day of worship, a day of acknowledging that you are indeed our God and the God of this universe. Help us to know you more and to serve you more fully in our lives. Help us to know the Christ more in our lives. We give you thanks for the life of Christ and the stories we have of Jesus and through the Bible and that great and grand witness of your faithfulness to humankind since the time of creation and even through these days now. Be with us. Help us to have the heart and mind and the spirit to accept your presence into our lives and in this world, to acknowledge it and to live into it the best we can each day. And may your peace indeed guard our hearts and guide our minds through all the things we face each day, through personal issues and health and relationships and jobs and school and all the stressors of life that come our way just by being awake each day and through our families and friends and our community. And certainly, oh God, through the struggles of this world and often what it can challenge us with and that we face. Help us to live in confidence and in hope and with the joy of knowing that you are indeed our God. In those moments where we may feel uncertain and frightened and skeptical and just wondering what is it good it is to be part of a faith community and to pray. At that very moment, oh God, may your spirit speak to us and guide us and help us, sustain us, support us this day and all of our days to come. As you have been faithful, let us be faithful as well. Help us this day, oh God, as we come to worship you. And through the very act of worship, we learn about you and how you're working in our lives and in this world. And we know that most fully in the life of your son, Jesus Christ, who teaches us the way to you and who has even taught us the way of prayer. By this prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our offertory hymn this morning is, We Give Thee But Thine Own. If you're able, please stand. Tony will play it through one time for us. And then we will sing together, We Give Thee But Thine Own.
As we come to this place in our worship of God, who is with us and loves us, is a reminder that we bring our best gifts to God, our first fruits of who we are and what we have. And then God uses that as blessed and used in this place by our hands, our feet, our voices, our minds, our strength to bring the light and good news of Jesus Christ to this community and to the world. We're not yet passing plates yet to receive the offering. We will do that hopefully very, very soon again. But we do have an offering box there in the back in the narthex. Please leave your offering there. And of course, each day during the week, we are just blessed to receive offerings in the mail. And there's offerings online as well, numerous ways of giving. Thank you for continuing to support the ministries here at Braden Church. God indeed blesses us mightily every day. And through that now, let us sing our words of praise to God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Beautifully done. Thank you. Be seated. Our gospel reading today is taken out of the Gospel of Luke in the ninth chapter, verses 28 through 36. Follow along with this gospel. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw the glory, Jesus' glory, and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came over and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. Amazed, astonished, awestruck, bowled over, dumbfounded, dumbstruck, flabbergasted, shocked, stunned, stupefied, thunderstruck. These are some of the words that are often used to describe being astounded by something or someone. There is much to be astounded about in this scripture passage from the Gospel of Luke. Just eight days prior, these events described in our scripture reading, Jesus had shared with his disciples that he would be rejected, put to death, and come to life three days later. He tells the disciples that whoever follows him 
would experience hardship and suffering, yet those standing there with him will see the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God present and accessible in Jesus and in the accomplishment of God's purpose through Jesus Christ. It is on an early Sunday morning that Jesus treks up a mountain, taking along with him Peter, John, and James to pray. What happened on that mountaintop was stunning, mysterious, full of light and energy. And the experience would not be fully understood by the three disciples until much, much later. Once on the mountaintop, as they were praying, Jesus is transfigured. The appearance of his face changes and his clothes become dazzling white. Peter, John, and James are stunned to also see two men talking with Jesus, and they recognize them to be Moses and Elijah. This makes for a glorious display. Moses and Elijah are discussing with Jesus his exodus, his departure, the one he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Since Jesus often chose to get an early start in the morning to pray, the disciples are a bit heavy with sleep. I imagine that they are rubbing their eyes, questioning if what they're seeing is real or are they dreaming? They were be, being given a glimpse of heaven. Jesus in all his glory. Peter's first reaction is to capture it, to memorialize it, to hold on to the moment forever. And he begins chatting excitedly about what they should do next. Master, this is a great moment. Let's build three dwellings, three booths, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And it seems like Peter wants to keep and put on display Jesus and these two heroes of the faith on the mountaintop, selling tickets for everyone to come see the greatest show on earth, like some sort of worship spectacle where people come to be entertained by a dazzling light show. I understand Peter's excitement and enthusiasm, being able to see a glimpse of heaven. This was beyond his thinking and understanding. And because of this, he thinks before processing what he has just witnessed. Peter had forgotten why they had gone up to the mountaintop with Jesus to pray. Peter was focusing on his own needs, the need to memorialize, to remember this mountaintop experience, not wanting it to go away. He wanted to put it in three boxes. The transfiguration didn't occur for anyone's entertainment or to meet a human need. It took place to glorify Jesus as he prepared to face the difficult time ahead of him, the cross. The dazzling display is brought to an abrupt end when the three disciples are suddenly enveloped, covered by a cloud. The cloud, if you recall, in the Old Testament represented the presence of God, so they were very afraid. And a voice says to them, This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. The three disciples are stunned into silence. The time on the mountaintop was to be a time of prayer and preparation, a time of worship. And this says to me, as I reflect on it and pray on it, that true worship is listening for the voice of God. The voice of God through Jesus Christ. It is about 
not listening to our own voices. It isn't about meeting our own needs. Worship isn't about entertainment. It isn't about the style of music we prefer or even how good a sermon is. Worship begins with listening for God's voice, being present. Listening to God's voice allows us to be in a time of prayer and preparation to glorify God through our prayers, through the word, through our singing. This mountaintop experience asks of us, what is worship? What is worship to you? What is worship to me? Who are we worshiping? And why do we worship? What happens the next day as Jesus and the three disciples come down from that mountaintop may help us to better understand the impact of true worship. This from Luke in the chapter 9, verses 37 to 46. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met Jesus. Just then a ma man shouted from the crowd, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly, a spirit seizes him, and at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, you faithless, faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him. The demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. Jesus had retreated to the mountaintop away from the world to worship God. And that would prepare him for the work ahead. It would prepare him for the cross. And have you ever been on a retreat? Maybe even on a mountaintop. I have. It's incredible to be away from everything. Responsibility. Letting someone else take care of leading me and that time away. It's hard to leave that place of rest and refreshment, that place of worship. This is the same for Jesus, to be in God's presence. It provided him with the strength and ability to return to the reality of human need, of pain and suffering. And he is immediately faced with this when returning to the valley below. Can you imagine coming back from retreat and immediately you are faced with having to work? Jesus is immediately faced with having to work. And Jesus, and they don't gloss this over, he expresses frustration upon being asked to heal a young man who is tormented with seizures. Now, scholars don't necessarily agree on who or what Jesus is frustrated with. I have my own theory. Remember, Jesus is both divine, fully divine, and fully human. He had just been in a state of divine glory. He was glowing. And now he is faced with the reality of his mission, that he is still very much needed. And I try to imagine what it was like for Jesus to balance that being fully human and fully divine. It's as if he had to purge himself of that frustration to do what was necessary. See, Jesus had been teaching his disciples what to do, and then they couldn't do it. 
he had been telling the people to believe in the power of God, and they weren't believing. So he was frustrated. But yet, he pushes through. And here, I believe, we see the effects of his time and worship. He pushes through his human feelings, using the energy of his worship experience to heal a suffering young man. And so it begs the question, what effect does worship have on us? When we walk into this place of worship and we worship, what do we take away with us out into the world? What effect does worship have on us? Why do we come to worship? How does it empower and equip us to answer and fulfill the call that God has on each of our lives. Worship is the time where we gather to focus our attention on God. Collectively, we gather. And we draw strength and we draw wisdom to prepare ourselves for the call to serve God in the real world. I like what theologian and minister David Lowe says about this. He says, worship can be the place where we hear God's voice, focus on the nature of grace as we experience it in the cross, meet each other in prayer and song, and leave renewed for lives of meaning and purpose that come through service to neighbor. True worship. Glorifying God is a transfigurative experience. Worship is to bring us into the presence of God. It's not about what we say or what we sing. It's about listening for the voice of God and responding to the call of God. Worship is to transform us. It changes us and prepares us to share the greatness of God in the world. Yesterday I watched a video that deeply touched me. It was a video of a choir group of Ukrainian citizens singing in a prayer of hope in an underground railway station in Kyiv just days before Ukraine was invaded by Russia. And some of the lyrics were translated into English, and I'd like to share this with you. May my prayer flow, flow to you like incense, sweet to you, my Lord, and may my heart without ceasing sing praises to my gracious God. They may not have known it, but this experience of worship an underground railroad was preparing them for the challenge ahead. They had no idea what they were going to face. And I wonder, and I believe actually, that the words of that song, that prayer of hope, are instilling in them this very moment a sense of hope and perseverance. What is God saying to you and to me about worship? Are there some of us who need to change our expectations, our views on worship? Do we see worship at church as a vital part of our lives? Do we see how worship can transform us, change us, equip us? We will face suffering. Many of us already have. We will face pain, difficulty. That is the nature of living in this world. It's a fact of life. Some will experience more than others. But can we look at embracing that living with the vision of what the world 
can be? I've thought a lot about that the past few days, trying to put myself in the place of having to take my family and leave where I live, and that has happened for centuries. This is not new, but this is new to us because we're watching it unfold before our very eyes. But what I have seen and heard from people in this country and around the world is the hope of what the world can be. That hope is there. That vision is there. And that's what we need to rally around, that we can see the glimpse of heaven on earth in each other. Let us be amazed. Let us be bowled over, flabbergasted, dumbfounded, astounded at the greatness of God. Let us pray. O gracious and holy God, may our prayers flow to you like incense sweet to your ear, my God. And may our hearts without ceasing sing praises to you, gracious God. May our worship be our lifeblood. May it flow through us as we worship you here today. May we take that energy, that light, that love into the world around us. Because we can make a difference. We are not helpless. We are not hopeless. For we have your spirit with us as we live. May we be encouraged because I know you hear our prayers and you answer our prayers and you empower us and you equip us. And that is the good news that you are with us. It is in your powerful name we pray. Amen. And our closing hymn today is I Love to Tell the Story. Will you please stand as we sing this beautiful hymn of faith?
we go today to tell the story of Jesus and his love. Just so simple as that. Not complicated, but we tell the story of Jesus and his love. We hope to see you here Wednesday for our soup and sandwich meal at 5.30, being served till 6.30. And then come and join us for worship, a very meaningful service on Ash Wednesday, always at 7 p.m. Go this week in knowing that you are enough and that your worship here today will empower and equip you to serve God in this world. So let us strive to live simply, love generously, serve faithfully, speak truthfully, pray daily, and leave everything else to God. Amen. Jesus is waiting, God so love.